Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for what is our last of a series of webinars that we have done through 2020 with the Bay Area Council uh, that st stems from our Bay Area Talent Symposium held in January in San Francisco. We've held webinars this year on topics like uh, addressing unconscious bias in hiring and promoting. We've also addressed topics like learning and working remotely as we've all made that shift this year due to the impact of COVID. And then we've also covered online learning in higher ed and tools and tips from each of the three major uh, public systems in the state. Today, we're focusing on some of the latest information that we have available to us on research and innovative ideas, and then also practical ways for responding to reskilling and retraining opportunities. In this world that we're in that's been so altered due to the economic and global health crises, you know, what does it take to really enter and succeed in the job market in 21 and beyond. In this webinar, we're going to examine this and how students and workers can redesign their learning pathways and reskill, or a term we're going to hear today, new skills, to meet changing workforce demands. We'll also hear from the educator community on adapting their programs to meet students' needs. And we'll also hear, thankfully, from those students and apprentices who are sharing how their new programs are helping them complete their education and enter the workforce. We'll also hear from a business leader who will talk about skill sets that are the most important and the way that data and analytics can be leveraged mm -hmm. to inform our reskilling programs to prepare for the future workforce right now. So without any more delay, I would like to introduce you to our wonderful panel and let them introduce themselves and share a little bit about what they do in their day-to-day. -day. I'd like to go in order of the alphabet. So I'll start with Chris, then Catherine, then Kyber, and then Shenny. So go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Erica. As I shared you know, earlier in our prep, that it's always nice to be first because you know my alphabetical um, you know, name starts with C and so um, ends with C as well as my surname. So I'm happy to go first. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Chu. I am based out of the San Francisco office, and I lead our talent and organization strategy practice for North America, but I also wear a hat that uh, leads our global learning and new skilling. And by new skilling, I just want to get that out there for people to understand. It's not just a buzzword. We believe that new skilling builds upon additive, you know, things that you already know. When we use reskilling, it gives you the impression that you have to relearn everything. But our, you know, our point of view is about new skilling and you can build upon things you already know in order to develop what is relevant for you to build the next generation of what you need to know, which is the new skilling component. So I'm happy to represent Accenture in our point of view and how we're supporting clients in building that um, agenda for our clients as well as how we are solving that for ourselves and like to share those um, learnings with uh, this group today thank you hello everyone my name is katherine squire i'm uh, the current vice president for the Student Senate for California Community Colleges. So we are a nonprofit that represents um, all 2.1 million students in the community college system. Um, and I'm also a student at San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton. It's about an hour away from Sacramento. Um, and you know, my role, I think, especially in this pandemic, has just been to um, get the needs of students out there uh, as much as possible and really talk to students. Um, Obviously, that's been hard right now just because we're in an online environment, but really get get to the root of what they're needing right now, um, both academically, socially, emotionally, um, to, to be able to really support, support them in their college journeys um, and really get them to where they need to be, whether that goes to transfer um, or to just graduate 
and um, get an associate's or some kind of certificate. Uh, so that has been my role just uh, in the last few months. Hello, everyone. My name is Kyber. Currently live here in Fremont, California. I am one of the first graduates from Calvary College and then working as an apprenticeship program with Accenture. Of maybe, are we, are we talking about it right now, the, the, whole, the whole panelist talk, or maybe it's just introduction for now? So yeah, so in a, in, a, in a few minutes, we'll be talking about my, my journey from uh, Calbright College to Accenture, and currently I'm in uh, Accenture Apprentice. Thank you guys. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here. My name is Shenny Weber. I am the Vice Chancellor for Workforce and Economic Development at the California Community uh, Chancellor's Office. And um, <clears throat> I oversee a portfolio of workforce and economic development programs uh, at the state level for 116 colleges, uh, representing over 2.1 million students. And um, it's, it's uh, quite, quite a bit of a challenge to try to address all of the workforce needs. Uh, of the state of California and now looking at recovery. So um, looking forward to this conversation today. Thank you so much, everyone. We're really thrilled that you're here. So let's get started. Um, so Shenny, let's go right back to you. The California Community College is extensively leaning out into this concept of reskilling and retraining, not only with the work that you're leading with Guided Pathways and the Strong Workforce Initiative, but also with the establishment of Calbright College as the 115th online community college in the state. Can you speak to what the work you're doing looks like and how you're engaging and attracting employers into this conversation that might be different than in the past? Um, thank you, Erica. So I, first of all, I just wanna say that I really appreciate that um, on this panel, we have the inclusion of student voice which I think it's really important, right? Coming from uh, the way I see it, it, student's voice is actually the customer voice, which is critical to everything that we do. Um, and then I really appreciate uh, Chris's, um, you know, sort of uh, statement about new skilling rather than reskilling. Um, that's a really, really good way to, to look at it. And, it, it, you know, just sort of a little bit of context and background what really guides us is what we, you know, our vision for success, which is essentially our strategic plan. Our, we call it our North Star. And the reason for that is because it's very clear, you know, what problem we're trying to solve for the state of California. And, and that problem is economic mobility and wage gains for individuals because of, you know, sort of the fraying uh, middle class, the American dream that everyone um, <clears throat> would like to participate in. Um, and um, we all know, uh, I think everybody on this panel knows that a great, the, the, a great way to get there is to provide people with the skills that they can um, really access a good paying job. And one of the things that we've been talking about is uh, it's somewhat controversial, uh, I think to a certain extent, is that it really shouldn't be about degrees or certifications. Um, you know, in my opinion, it really should be about skills and credentials and putting that together, right? Acquiring skills or cluster of skills that can get you um, <clears throat> to your uh, end destination. And whether you're transferred to a four year, you're you know, trying to get a master's or PhD, at the end of that education journey, everybody wants a good paying career. You know, it's, it's about the workforce, it's about the job, right? And, and um, the skills clusters, uh, and credentials is a lot more important in, in my opinion. Um, and then the fact that we have to redesign everything around the student journey, it changes the way we have to organize how we deliver education in our system. And so um, in the last year or so, what we've been doing is putting in place competency-based education regulations that will allow our colleges to change how they offer um, programs. And 
I think California is a little bit behind uh, uh, the game, but but we will catch up. Um, the Department of Education has rules about competency-based education, which I think um, needs a little bit more work. And I'm very optimistic that we can do that with the under the new administration that's coming in. The other piece of it is uh, credit for prior learning as a really powerful tool and very important tool for us to uh, capture uh, individuals' work experience. Everybody has some kind of experience and comes to the table with existing skills, especially those that's coming out of the military and, and you know, trying to match those skills with what employers are looking for, right? To the, to the jobs that are vacant out there. And <clears throat> yeah, finally, just we're looking at employment engagement 2.0. Uh, and the reason I say that is because we really need to figure out how to scale work-based learning opportunities for our students. And, and it's, I'm not just talking about internships and internships sometimes are hard to, to come by. Talking about you know, pre-apprenticeships, apprenticeships, on-the-job training, whatever work experience that's relevant to the students, building that into the education um, experience um, and getting employers at the table. I think the, the easy part is to get them at the table. We, we do that all the time. I think the hard part is keeping at the, them at the table and um, having that skin, skin in the game where they are partners with us uh, with, through the lifelong education of our students and that they are, that we're able to sustain that relationship, that partnership. And then they're at the end of the programs looking to hire our students uh, for, for the jobs that they need because we are delivering the skills uh, that's necessary for those jobs. So I'll just um, kind of wrap that up there. <laughs> no, I think that's fantastic. If anyone had something they wanted to pivot off that particular comment? No? Okay, then we'll move on. I just didn't know how deep you guys wanted to go back and forth on some of these, but you're welcome to if something stirs you. So Catherine, I'd like to ask you, as a member of the Student Senate within the community colleges, what are you learning from your membership of students about their needs? And what is the Senate's role in voicing those to the leadership? Yeah, definitely. So um, our, our Senate's role is really to, um, we, have, we have a very, a very intimate structure, I want to say, within our organization. And so we have connections with all 116 colleges in our system. So we have at least one representative from each college from their student government that we are in consistent communication with. Uh, they're keeping us updated on what's going on at their college. Um, and also, if they ever, ever need help or ever need us to provide guidance, that's really what our role is, is to provide any guidance and support that we can um, for the student journey. Um, to make sure their student representation at their college and that their needs are being heard by their administration. Um, so that's really been our role. Uh, specifically in this pandemic, it's really been about working with our partner organizations to make sure, um, you know, our students' needs are being met, especially right now, you know, it's a difficult time with COVID. Um, and so uh, I think part of, part of that and one overarching theme that I want to bring into this as well is that you know, the needs of our students are very diverse because we have such a diverse population of students in our system. Um, there's, I think it's great, like we're having all this talk about new skilling and reskilling, re um, but that journey is going to look different for every type of student. It's going to look different for an older student who doesn't, you know, doesn't have that same experience with technology, hasn't grown up on technology like a younger student has. Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm in a very unique position, for example, because I'm a community college student myself, but so is my mother. Um, and so I've gone through that journey already, but doing it with her and supporting her has been a completely different experience than it was for me. And even just this semester, she's, you know, taking classes online for the first time and her syllabus says we're using Zoom to meet. And she has no, she had no idea what that was. <laughs> um, and so even that kind of basic level of understanding um, is super important to recognize, right? Not every not every type of student has that. Um, I was just on another panel with a different student kind of talking about her needs as well. Um, and she she talked about being an international student when she first came here. And um, she actually didn't know how to use a computer. She had never used one before, had never done her work online. 
Um, and so she turned on, turned in her first paper all written um, and got a zero on it because, you know, the teacher, the professor made an assumption that every student in the class would have that knowledge. Um, and so those are the kinds of stories and experience I, experiences I think are important to recognize um, and really keep in mind. Um, and I think that's part, that's what's so, you know, beneficial about having the student voices that we're able to provide those stories um, to partner organizations and those who are really working on improving our online and distance learning um, for, for students in those situations. So uh, I think that's a, a super beneficial perspective to have in all these conversations that are going around um, reskilling and reskilling. Agreed, definitely. Chris, you bring the perspective of talent development within a business who's taking in students from potential colleges and programs. So much of our work over this past year has been focused on strengthening those connections so that our learners and job seekers are hearing directly from industry about what will be needed for success in the future. What skills or strategies has Accenture identified as key in, incre in this increasingly digital world? And how are data and analytics informing your research and your actions on this front? Thanks uh, for that question, Erica. I could speak all day on uh, trying to address that uh, because it's a very complicated uh, question, but I'll start with skills first. And what we find is when we define what's new and what is digital because we're all about you know defining what is the future of work what's the you know future skills that we need for people to succeed too often it's clouded in and emphasized so much around digital and the actual hardcore skills of digital meaning you know, specific technologies whether it's amazon web services or google or you know cloud ai and some people throw in their blockchain, which I'm still trying to figure out what is actually blockchain skills, to be honest. But that's not exactly everything that we see is, is important in terms of, you know, future skills. Yes, it's important to understand those technologies and, you know, for the specific applications that companies are building and for us to build, we do need that uh, skill set. But there's two other areas for skills that we also see a need and, and are looking for. One is the business acumen side. So how do you apply those digital technologies into HR, IT, finance, supply chain, and even in instances of retail or instances of, you know, whatever the front office, we call it front office and back office. And having that business understanding and applying how does digital you know, impact those industries and what skills do you need to apply and, and improve the um, experience of your customers and experiences of people that are working, you know, in those areas. And the last one is also the soft skills. So if I think about it, you know, there's hard skills, there's functional business skills, but there's the uh, soft skills, which is, you know, problem solving, uh, growth mindset, which means, you know, your ability to want to learn and not, you know, the digital is something that, you know, it's going to be a continuous adventure and journey as you, uh, you know, look forward to the future. It has to be something you want to embrace and you have to have the agility, flexibility to want to learn. And you also have to have the ability to teach others as well, because, you know, your role as a digital, you know, native, if you are early adopter and you're learning how to bring this into an organization, you have to bring others along in sharing how you've succeeded in your journey to be able to communicate and develop others. So these are the soft skills, I think, that are also important. And those are the things that uh, we, you know, look for in terms of all those three areas. Some of the strategies that uh, we, are building for ourselves as well as helping clients, um, you know, tap into this. Is we we think of it as an ecosystem. So everything, you know, if you think about everything in software and everything in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley is about ecosystems. So we think about that similarly when it comes to learning and new skilling. You've got to identify the pipeline, the talent 
a place where you could tap into the skills. You've got to have alliance partners, you know, learning institutions, community colleges, universities. And then you also have to work with other organizations like Pearson or, you know, with Accenture together. You have to really understand the whole ecosystem because it's not as simple as solving it as an inter individual company. When we used to do 20 years ago, I'm going to date myself because I've been with uh, my company for many years. We used to be standalone and thinking of how we recruit and how we find the right skills to bring into our organization. We had a very limited focus of sets of schools and we had a very well-defined program to bring them in and centrally train our people how to code. Back then it was mainframe and how to use client server. It was uh, very dated in terms of you know, what we're understanding today. And then the complexity and this pace and the speed at which you know, uh, skills are really needed to um, keep pace with the, the technologies. We can't, no, we can't rely on the old method of a standalone organization and trying to tap into you know, these existing schools that we recruited for. We were 50,000 people back then. We ourselves today are half a million people in terms of a global workforce. We have 500,000 people and the organization and the complexity that we have around bringing digital skills and technologies to our clients and developing that talent, we have to look and expand our view in terms of what are our ecosystem partners and providers. So, you know, based on the complexity and the pace and the scale that we need, we had to expand our thinking and not just think about ourselves as you're one player in, in just going to recruit and, and look at the same talent pools. We have to really think about the world and the, you know, the available talent that exists and tap into all that. And then, you know, the rounding out, you know, the, the final question, Erica, is really the role of analytics and the role of data and deriving that insight. We're getting more sophisticated in using AI and using analytics uh, methods to tap into those alternative talent pools. So I think earlier, the analogy of skills. Skills is really the currency now for learning. So where can you identify those types of skills? You have you know, numerous methods to, to go tap into that using all the capabilities, you know, like LinkedIn or you know, all these employers that are looking for uh, you know, their roles and their skills in, in all these different databases that exist. So what we try to do is find alliance partners that can go out and scrape all the profiles and we understand what the you know, others are looking for in terms of those future roles and skills. And then identifying those talent pools where, you know, critical problem solving or engineering or or specific technologies or you know business functions you have the ability now to tap into those sources of talent pools whether it's from a community college or from you know an existing industry that might you know be declining we see a lot of auto manufacturing skills you know becoming um, sitting you know and trying to determine where their next move is so we can tap into that you know with a, a, a lens of skills and then how do you repurpose that and how do you help to bring that you know, skill set into life sciences or, or computing or you know, there's repurposable new skilling uh, opportunities if you look at the, the talent pools that exist. So that's kind of like how we think of it, very you know, broad based in terms of using analytics to identify those talent pools. And you know, being able to tap into that, we bring that for ourselves as well as we help our clients see that ecosystem and build that you know, for them as well. Erica, you know, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Shani. Well, you know, um, I'm, I'm, you know, very glad to hear Chris talk about, um, you know, the in terms of the, the the skills and that being the currency, right? And then finding where those skills are, um, because that really speaks to a couple things that we're trying to focus on. Um, 
And I would love to hear uh, Chris's thoughts on that. You know, first of all, uh, the, ho the whole entrepreneurial mindset, I think that's really, really in key and important uh, to teach, you know, our students um, because you're looking at the problem solving, you're looking at the growth mindset, you're, you're looking uh, at, you know, cohort learning style and, and the communications, the soft skills that, that he's talking about. And then one thing I think that's that's uh, we're very interested in in doing at the state level is to figure out a structure for a, a more uh, credential transparency. How do you document right the skill sets that our students uh, pick up along the way with demonstrated you know competencies, and then be able to for industry to find that and see that a lot clearly you know a lot easier uh, to be able to to. Uh, do you know sort of be plug into the AI analytics that you use to find people with the right skills for those jobs that you're trying to fill? I think right now there's not a lot of transparency, and it's it's a big it's a problem that I think we need to look at um, as as part of the whole ecosystem figuring out how to solve that. That's a a huge challenge. I think we're trying to standardize or figure out what is a good. Um, certification. So there's, you know, different levels. I think you can, you know, attack this problem. One is your know, certification for specific technologies. So Amazon Web Services or Google, you know, cloud, for example, they have certifications where you have to actually test and pass. And so that's very sophisticated. What we're, you know, envisioning when, in our talks with other communities, when you're building this, it has to be a community solution. It can't be, you know, individual company. In order to do that, you almost have to have, and we're, we're trying to get there. So this is, you know, the ability to work and collaborate as a community is almost having a profile, you know, internally in the organization, we want to create a skills profile where you continue to build and and uh, develop and show proficiency so within a company we're building this solution where you have a uh, set almost like a resume or internal skill profile and you want to be a data scientist and, and if you're a business analyst or whatever your journey you define what your journey is and then you're getting content and you're getting learning inside the organization which we're building these programs for and then that kind of profile is is attached to you individually and then we want to make this relevant and more relevant so that it's transferable not just within this organization but to another organization so you know that's where the starting point is you have transferability from organization to organization and then it starts you know if you think about it at the you know college community college education level if you've got a standard which we all can kind of collaborate to say, here's a good you know, courses or set of courses that you could demonstrate good problem solving skills. And then when you complete those, you almost have a proficiency score that's you know, demonstrable and, and can be transferable coming into an organization or then leaving that organization. So we're getting to that point where we're trying to figure how to best represent that. So that's getting into blockchain, you know, when you do have a secured profile for yourself by an individual, and then you walk around with that and go to an employer so that it's no longer a resume, it's actual skills that you've demonstrated proficiency and you built a certain level of proficiency and you can enter into that organization and continue to build that and then, you know, leave that organization and go to another industry. So we're starting to think that way and to convince, you know, companies to start assessing and measuring what is, you know, the skill proficiency that's more standard. So I don't have an answer, but we are trying to solve that so that it means something for those, you know, community colleges and, and uh, educational uh, uh, partners that we're looking for so that you could bring that in. And then that has, you know, a measurable, target for people to you know strive towards that they could show their employers and employers like us that's great thank I you think, i think that's absolutely great and it's actually something we've talked about even in our own council meetings through the Bay Area council for a couple of years is the challenge of 
having everyone in the ecosystem have an agreed upon set of yes. language and a definition of what these skills mean and what that would translate to in your industry or your jobs that you have available so that it opens that funnel of available talent across the entire spectrum. So yes, as you as you solve that problem, Chris, please share your learnings with us along the way, because it's definitely the nut we've been trying to crack for a while, you know, whether well, we sit on an education spoke I or think, we're in that spoke. I think that's a great point to raise, Erica. I think what we're seeing is I'm encouraged because this conversation probably wasn't something that employers were very selfishly focusing on their own employees. But when we went through the last, say, six, seven years where industries are being disrupt disrupted, you know, we have Detroit, and we were always using that, that as the example when, you know, car manufacturing was really devastated. And so what do you do with all those individuals? You don't want that, you know, to end up in so many pockets of, uh, of, an, of any industry. So earlier on, you know, we worked with um, a large telecom company that became an entertainment company. Actually, I couldn't share their client name. It is AT&T because they have been very public about sharing their investment on developing people, not just for keeping you know, them employed within AT&T, because the number of, of positions or jobs that they have in the future were a lot less than they had in the workforce, but they were trying to define what would be the future needs and the future skills. So they didn't you know, create a program around, let's just re retrain and spend all this money to retrain people around you know, what they know today to be able to be successful in AT&T. Let's make a, an investment because we do see a duty to play within the community because there's pockets of the community that they were very well involved and they see that as a declining you know industry for them or declining you know labor market but they spent over a billion dollars on on learning and and new skilling or reskilling they they called it and that was so that they had the ability to give their employees you know, basic skills and opportunities so that when they leave AT&T, they have opportunities within the community that they're entering. So that kind of collaboration, employer to employer, I'm encouraged to see that is much more the focus over the last, you know, five years. And then now even more important is facilitating that industry to industry connection that we're very proud of. Uh, during COVID, we introduced you know, a connection point where we see a declining you know, industry of hospitality workers in the hotel industry, for example, but very strong customer service skills that would be very, very applicable to, you know, the increasing need in warehouse or, you know, healthcare or other instances where they could use that customer service, you know, set of skills and facilitating you know, employer to employer to serve and, and help the overall community. So we're really stepping up as employers to be responsible businesses. So I think on the positive side, I do see, you know, more and more, you know, evolution or, or transformation, you know, in, within companies to think more and more like that. That's great. Thank you so much. Kyber. At long last, will you please tell us about your incredible journey to and through Calbright and what you're doing now and what you hope for your future career opportunities? Yeah, thank you, Chris, for saying that diplomas are not everything and for thinking of the military. So I'm really from Afghanistan where did I receive some type of training for residential wiring as a teen. To work with anything computer related for me was and by my society, especially with my society and my parent was uh, basically of uh, and just an attempt to playing pong. <laughs> so there weren't many households in my neighborhood uh, to have computers. One of my friends had a computer at that time 
And then I was begging my dad to buy me one too. So he declined a couple of times, but eventually he, I managed to make him for me. So since then, I always wanted to just work with the technology. I think the absence of computer at, and internet at the time for me just kind of helped my desire to find computer because the computer was the greatest mystery for me at the time. My mother urged me to study accounting where I was growing up in Afghanistan. So I did so while I was working as a, a interpreter for the US military. When I moved here in California, I tried to transfer my credits to pursue my degree here in the United States to get a bachelor's degree for science, but I was not able to because nobody would credits. So I'd have to start all over again. So it took it took me several uh, online uh, training courses, certifications, but nowhere I applied to work. Hmm. and no one would hire me with those. So when I heard Calbright College was seeking for a student, I immediately applied for that. I was enrolled there uh, for their cybersecurity program in October 2019. So Calbright program is basically self-based, but it does require some type of a weekly engagement. The accountability and the flexibility Calbright provided me uh, that made it possible for me to finish the program in seven months. So Calbright provided me uh, access to LinkedIn uh, skill set certificate, uh, cybersecurity introductory course, and a Pearson proctoring voucher. I received helpful criticism over my LinkedIn profile. My resume and cover letter to mock all the way to mock up interview to demonstrate my better values to potential employers. I had a support, supportive staff to, throughout my journey with Calbright. They would just regularly check my work progress and then they actively were looking for recruit, recruitment opportunity for me while I was taking the program with them. So the amount, of, uh, the amount of career growth and the support was not ended only after graduating from Calbright. The support continued all the way to recruiter with the Accenture, as Accenture col uh, collaborated with them uh, to help me to, to do best in my hiring process. Once employed by Accenture as an app cloud analyst, then I had access and I unlock a lot of potential with that. Accenture, because Accenture provides such a valuable certifications free of charge for their employees. That made me grow my knowledge even more than uh, Calbright. So with so much content to get through Calbright and Accenture, I've done a great of job making me feel comfortable throughout all of these apprenticeship program and with I'm thanking Calbright for making me to be in this position. Thank you guys. That's really such an amazing story, really. One, when you first shared with us how you came to this country with units that weren't transferable, that just breaks my heart, just personally, because I can't imagine how many students there are who do just that same thing and have to start over and or get discouraged and maybe don't start over. Um, it goes back to what Shenny was saying earlier around compensatory education and the need to really kind of break apart how we're currently looking at the value of prior learning and do it differently that really takes what you've done into, a, into account. So, but you persisted, you got through, you're doing your apprenticeship, you're learning a lot. It's an amazing story. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing that. Chris, based on that and based on, you know, some of your prior comments, what are some of the ways that you're building business resiliency 
while also investing in the reskilling of workers into roles that are growing in demand. I think that you touched on this a little bit earlier, but the investment for a company to really develop their own talent is, is in, in a critical one. And it's something that takes significant resources. So how, how are you doing that? And how are you justifying those things to your leaders to say these investments will pay off? So I think that's um, a very topical question. And it's unique because in the Bay Area, the, um, you know, the, the Googles, whatever you call it, the FANG or the GAFAs or MAGs, there's all kinds of acronyms. Mm -hmm. We found, you know, five, six years ago that everybody wanted the same, you know, source of talent. Everybody wants that, you know, Google, Googler, you know, profile, you know, software engineering. And uh, that, you know, talent strategy was always relying on your ability to attract because you were, you know, the hottest ticket in town. That's that war for talent that everybody wants to, you know, tap into. But there are so many industries and so many other employers that we work with and so many clients, and including ourselves. We have to compete with that. We can't compete. You know, we don't have the same value proposition. So what can we turn around to say we can invest in our own talent or we can have a value proposition that says we'll invest and grow your ability to develop skills and be relevant over time. And I think the tide is turning because now, you know, many of the um, workforce and the people entering the workforce and people that are, you know, going through their second or third career, they want to look at employers that are going to take that seriously and looking at building resilience, building, you know, learning programs that invest and have a path for individuals to develop their you know, skills to be more relevant. So you know, that's what we see is, is you know, the talent development. We used to have talent strategies that we focus on, build, buy, borrow, and bought. So build is you, know, you build your own, buy, you go out and, and acquire companies or acquire you know, those skills, borrow, you, know, you tap into your know, different, uh, platforms uh, or contractors and you borrow that that skill set and then bot is what we call you know the automation or the you know uh, AI working side by side with technology because that's going to be a lever that you know if you can't go and find that talent you have to go and, and figure out how to use technology to partner with that you know leading technology in order to develop that um, you know capability so the first most important one is talent development and looking for the alternative talent pools that uh, you know everybody is trying to tap into. That's why you know our um, you know building resilience strategy was around. Yeah, I shared earlier, which we can't rely on the same internship and uh, you know internships are are still something we use. We still go to targeted schools for our, our certain segments of our consulting practice, but we can't rely on that all, alone because you know internships are only you know six weeks, seven weeks, or eight weeks, depending on you know the duration that you come in. We need you know more alternative talent pools and also a duration like a year, which the apprenticeship you know model provides. You're going to be getting you know, hardcore skills through uh, experiences working with uh, engagements and working with clients. And then we get the benefit because we get, you know, to tap into people like Hyper. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to find an alternative talent pool that can tap into somebody with such great resilience and great uh, talent, but we couldn't find that, you know, if we were using the old, old view in terms of, you know, looking at internships and looking at, you're hiring from certain schools. So building resilience and building, you know, these apprenticeship programs and looking at alternative pools of talent where we could bring that into our ecosystem, that's what I think we're seeing more and where we're actually advising our clients. The other, you know, component to that is what we call, you know, the Spotify of learning. So thinking about the learning itself. You know, uh, a lot of companies think around hours of training and, and they think about, 
you know, number of courses that they're going to provide for their employees. Well, the cost equation and the benefit of digital is that most people are now learning, you know, with their phones and, you know, learning, you know, bite-sized learning. I have two teenage daughters and they learn so much, you know, for, through five-minute videos. They, you know, are able to, you know, uh, spew out facts and, and demonstrate proficiency around a topic by just watching, you know, something for five minutes. And it's also not something that's overwhelming because when you see a lot of uh, companies, they think, well, we're going to have to reinvest in, in our training our employees and we're going to spend all this money and put all these courses online and expect our employees to go out and learn. Well, the reality is that's one, overwhelming. And that's two, it's, it's thinking of just pushing things. So we are taking lessons on how people are consuming entertainment. So how you consume music, how you consume movies and, and binge watch. We want that same, you know, appetite to come from learning. So we're seeing there's a lot of parallels in terms of how people consume learning, similar to how they consume any kind of content. So personalizing, using technology, creating that platform for learning, we see a lot of return on investment. So that's another, you know, building resilience, building those types of programs around, you know, corporate learning, and then looking at uh, alternative talent pools to feed into that uh, ecosystem of learning. And that's, you know, what we, you know, all the time I can collaborate on that today. Like I said, I'd be happy to, you know, share how we, uh, we try to bring this for ourselves as well as uh, for other organizations. Thank you. Uh, back over to Shenny. What else could you share with us about how the Strong Workforce Initiative is accelerating guided pathways opportunities for learners? And what is the next phase? Well, um, I can, you know, I will share with you that right now, because of, of what we've all experienced and some of the things that Catherine uh, talked about, you know, the, the diverse needs of students, what we've experienced under this pandemic, um, the, 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 the lack of social safety net so to speak, um, for a lot of our students. So our focus is really around recovery with equity and what does that look like and, and what do we uh, need to, to focus on. There's a lot of, um, uh, I think, challenges that we have, but um, you know, as a, as a as a ecosystem, I think if we all work together, we can we can solve a, a lot of these problems. And one of them is really broadening work-based learning. Uh, along the lines of what uh, Chris was talking about, I was very encouraged to see uh, Censure uh, creating an apprenticeship program. You know, we have a $50 million uh, California Apprenticeship Initiative grant that, that we put out every year uh, for our colleges to create uh, apprenticeship programs in partnership with employers. And we've been encouraging our colleges to partner with industries that are non-traditional, right? Apprenticeships, a lot of times, when that word comes up, we think about you know the construction and the trades industry, which is very traditional. But the whole concept of apprenticeship can be applied to a lot of different industry. We just saw a really good example with Accenture. Um, it can be applied in in, in hospitality, in agriculture, and healthcare. Um, these are what we consider the more non-traditional sectors, um, and we really would like to encourage uh, folks to do that. And and I think the partnership with with uh, employers are going to be critical for our students in terms of uh, their learning and their success. Uh, to be able to acquire the skills that's needed, that companies are looking for, all of the, the things that, that Chris talked about, um, and also making sure that we are focusing on a lot of our underserved regions in California, you know, like the Inland Empire, the Central Valley, these are all areas that um, there are a lot of, that's a lot of untapped talent, right? And a lot of lost opportunities. Um, maybe this pandemic is the, you know, the silver lining is that uh, companies, perhaps more companies will be more uh, open to remote work, which means your geographic matching of talent, uh, part of that problem could be solved um, and, you know, sort of the commute or travel issue. So that's something to, to, to think about. The other really huge area that really we are focusing a lot of efforts on is what Catherine talked about, 
uh, what used to be the non-traditional students, the adult learners, are actually now the traditional students, right? The, the folks that we really need to, it's, it's a, actually a, a much bigger part of our population at the community colleges, but we haven't really focused our efforts and energy on that population. They're, they're more than, um, I would say they're more than 60% of the students that, that we currently serve. But most of our efforts are focused on the degree, the transfer seeking students. And we haven't uh, built our systems and our financial aid and our student support services wraparound to support the adult learners. That is going to be the key moving forward if we're going to look at recovery with equity. That is such a good point about the student support services because it's absolutely critical to have all of that in place. It's not just the course availability. There are so many other components of getting people into those classes and them actually persisting and being successful. It could be tutoring, it could be English language support, it could be financial support, it could be childcare, it could be mm -hmm. healthcare. I mean, there's a number of things that our learners definitely need across the spectrum. And the more we can provide those and make it easier for them to participate in what's available and that they know about those programs in their local area, it's it's the key to them being successful. Um, I think you know, if, if, if I can add just one more thing, you know, our community colleges are critical assets in, in workforce training. We do a lot of career education programs. And um, one thing that we don't necessarily do, which I think is something that we need to start focusing on is what if we have one measure of success and all of our mm. career programs and that measure of success is job placement rates. What if that was the one measure? How would that change how we deliver education? Yep, that's very interesting. I'd love to be a fly on the wall of that conversation <laughs> as you pull together an ecosystem to discuss it. Um, thank you for that. In looking at the time, we have just blown through this hour. We have about five minutes left, which is nowhere near long enough to continue such a great discussion. But I think I wanna skip ahead to my last question, which is actually our favorite question that we ask every panel that we have done this year. And the question is for all of you and to try to keep your answer to a minute or less. We wanna ask you what, with all of this information that we've talked about today and with what you know about what's happening in your world, what makes you hopeful? So we'll start with Catherine. Yeah, um, I mean, I think the fact that, you know, this is, that we're even having this conversation right now, the fact that this is being prioritized, um, made a priority, especially, especially in, in my community college, uh, and in the community college system, just because, um, you know, I really think the community college system in particular does a great job of just supporting every type of student there is. And there's obviously work that needs to be done, but the fact that you know that there are, is a system behind you supporting academically 100% um, really gives me a lot of hope, especially in my college journey. You know, I'm uh, in my junior year now, um, I've actually uh, transferred out, but um, uh, the fact that I've been able to make it so far um, haven't been, you know, overburdened with student debt, which is a huge problem. And I can safely say that I, you know, um, I love my my chosen career path, and I'm confident that there's really going to be a a um, a job secure for me out there once I graduate. So that gives me hope as a student. <laughs> That's awesome. And over to you, Kyber. Yeah. So. Right before I joined Calbright, the, the promise, well, I did a lot of research about Calbright because they had this program about job placement. So that kind of gave me a hope and the energy to study a little harder to finish up the program. So that was one of the reasons I finished up the program, kind of speed it up to get the program done in seven months. It, it, they say usually it takes about nine to 12 months, but I was able to finish up in, in seven months. 
So right now in my current uh, role with Accenture, I just give huge hope. Accenture is a great company. It's growing bigger and bigger. They have right now over 550,000 employees around the world, pretty big. And then the amount of education they're providing as it just gives me huge hope that I can just grow within the company and we can work remotely. It's a one of the hope and Accenture were ahead of the game right before this pandemic. So they're practicing this social work, uh, I'm sorry, distance working, uh, remote working. So I'm very hopeful to be uh, with Accenture after my apprentice program and to get a full-time, possibly extended contract with them, hoping to be there and grow within the company. That's a great goal. Thank you so much, Kyber. Shenny. Okay, so um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> And uh, let's not waste a good pandemic. I think uh, I jokingly say that, but really education is the least disrupted uh, sector, right, prior to COVID. I'm hoping that this is our moment of disruption and that we seize this moment and that really um, have our colleges, you know, move forward and look at what higher education should look like when we emerge on the other side, right? Um, it can't be what it is before. It really can't, we can't go back to what it's before. And I'm very optimistic and hopeful that you know that our colleges can do this because when we had to, they pivoted within a month and moved most of education online. That was a huge monumental task for our 116 colleges. So I'm 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 hopeful and I'm 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 you know looking forward to uh, the transformation of our system to meet the needs of our students. Thanks, Jenny. And last but not least, Chris, a real quick hopefulness. I think you know what encourages me and, and is most hopeful is this whole digital era, this new wave, it opens up so much, you know, possibilities. We see that you know demand is exceeding supply in, in every facet of, of skills that we're looking for in a workforce. That's good news. But you know the problems and the challenges we're helping our clients find that talent, tap into it, acquire it, develop it. I mean, there's just so much work that we're so busy, and we're you know as Kyber shared, we you know are growing at um, a, an amazing you know and for, fortunate enough to be growing. We constantly need to go and source and find, and we are investing so much in developing that talent. So abundance is great. You know, the hopefulness is let's continue to figure out like tapping into these alternative talent pools and challenge the way that we think about, you know, developing talent and sourcing talent. And this just, again, like Shani says, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, opening up many possibilities and we just have to figure it out together. That's a great point to end on. And definitely all of you today and your thoughts have made me more hopeful about the system we're in. I want to thank you all for joining us today, and I want to thank our attendees as well and our organizers who are behind the scenes making this work well. I want to end on a closing note with all of you. As we shared in the last, in our series of webinars that we've done this year with content interests that came out of our Building the Bay Area Talent Symposium in San Francisco in January, all of this work would not have happened without the vision and the partnership of the late Linda Bedrosian. She was the SVP of the Education and Workforce Committee at the Bay Area Council, who I had the pleasure of working with and calling a friend for over the last six years. She was a force to know and work with her. She had incredible dedication, work ethic, and high expectations of herself and everyone around her. She was a delight. We present this body of work this year as an exhibit of her legacy and commitment to supporting talent development and opportunities for Californians. She told me this spring when she was struggling that she was very proud of the work we'd done together to prepare for this year's events and that it was a highlight in her career. And I could definitely add that it is in mine as well. We miss her presence and her experience and her expertise 
I miss her strength and her brilliance. And at the same time, all of us who knew her carry with her, carry with her with us every day as we continue to progress in this work that we know is an incredible mission for all of us here in California. So I just wanted to close with that today to remember where this all started and remember my good friend, Linda Bedrosian. So thank you for joining us. We're very happy you've attended. And hopefully in year 21, we'll have another great series that you can come and join us with. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Erica. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.